Okay, we're going to talk about meninges and dural venous sinuses and answer the questions, what are the meninges, what are dural venous sinuses, and what is the deal with the cerebral circulation? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So here we're going to take this coronal section at the top of the skull and blow it up, and we can see the layers of the scalp, and deep to that, the skull bones, deep to that, the meninges, and deep to that is the brain tissue, and our focus is going to be right there on the meninges, specifically the dura mater, and the arachnoid mater and the PM mater, okay? And so here are all the things with the dura, arachnoid, and PM moters that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna start with the dura mater and that it consists of really two different layers. So the dura mater is the most superficial layer of the meninges right there. And it is, the, the Latin for dura is tough, or Latin of tough is dura, and the Latin of mater is mother. It literally means the tough mother, because the dense, the dura mater is consisting of dense, irregular, collagenous connective tissue. It's very tough. And there are two layers to the dura mater, a periosteal layer that lines the internal surface of the skull, and the meningeal layer that's continuous with the brain and spinal cord. So there's our dura mater, and there's layer one, all on the the internal surface of the skull. It's basically the periosteum on the inside of the skull, and it ends at the foramen magnum. Now, the second layer of the dura mater here in orange, that's one that's going to be continuous with the brain and all the way down the spinal cord. And now we're going to go to the dural septae. And the dural septae, there are two, so basically the two dural layers are bound together and only separate when they form dural septae or dural venous sinuses. So in this coronal section, we zoom in, there's the skull and inside lining that, and then there's the brain, and there's our dura mater. Now watch the dura mater is together. There's actually two layers the whole way, and now they divide into a periosteal and a meningeal layer. And when they divide, that's when you see the dural septa, and that's when you see a dural venous sinus. So the dural septae restrict displacement of the brain, much like a seatbelt does for us when we're driving around the car. It keeps us, the valuable um, things inside the car, stable. Same with the dura mater, with the valuable thing in the brain, in the skull, the brain. The falx cerebri, the tentorium cerebelli, and the falx cerebelli are the three things we're going to talk about. Let's start with the falx cerebri, where falx is Latin for sickle. So here is this posterior superior view of the skull, the dural septae are shown and the brain's removed. And there's our falx cerebri. And it does kind of look like a sickle, like that. And it courses anteriorly from the cristigalli of the uh, ethmoid bone all the way back and it fuses with the tentorium cerebelli. And on the very top of the mohawk is the superior sagittal sinus and on the bottom is the inferior sagittal sinus. Uh, the falx cerebri is vertical and it separates our cerebral hemispheres within the longitudinal cerebral fissure. So there is the falx cerebri. There are the two cerebral hemispheres that it is dividing within that longitudinal cerebral fissure. And at the very bottom is the corpus callosum. Now, the tentorium cerebelli is a bit different in that it is horizontal and... Oh, hi, Ireland. Uh, it's my daughter, Ireland. Okay, so the tentorium cerebelli, it's horizontal, and it separates our occipital lobes and cerebellum. And so here we're now going to see the same view, and there's our tentorium cerebelli, and it is going to be horizontal, perpendicular to the falx cerebri. So here's a posterior view of the brain, and there's our two cerebral hemispheres, and there's our two cerebellar hemispheres, and there's the spinal cord. So now we're going to take this picture and go shing and put the skull around it. And then notice there... In yellow is the periosteal layer of the dura mater, and in orange, there is the meningeal layer. And notice that the periosteal layer fuses at the frame and magnum, and the meningeal layer goes all the way down the spinal cord. So there is our tentorium cerebelli. It's separating our cerebellum from occipital lobe, and there's our falx cerebri that is vertical, tentorium cerebelli, horizontal. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this section and move it back a little bit. And this is the view that we're going to see. Okay, we're behind. Now we're more posterior to the frame and magnum. And we're going to see the falx cerebelli, which is located between cerebellar lobes. So there's the falx cerebelli, which is right along the vermis between the two cerebellar hemispheres. And then the tentorium cerebelli, which is separating the cerebellum from the occipital lobe. And there's the falx cerebri.
Now we're going to talk about dural venous sinuses. And dural venous sinuses are venous channels located between periosteal and meningeal layers of dura mater. And they receive blood from the cerebral veins primarily, but also diploic, diploic, and emissary veins. So let's talk about the venous channel. So there is the dura mater and layer one and layer two. And between the two layers is the dural venous sinuses, and in this case, we're showing the superior sagittal sinus. Um, and the dural venous sinuses receive blood primarily from cerebral veins. And so there is a cerebral vein, and you see it dumping into the dural venous sinus. But you also have some of these, and that is the big one. That's what put a star there. That's the main thing. All these cerebral veins, like the great vein of Galen, all these are going to eventually end up in a dural venous sinus. Okay. The emissary veins go from the scalp through the skull and they drain into one of the dural venous sinuses and the diploic veins go from basically the skull into one of these uh, dural venous sinuses. Now dural venous sinuses are similar to veins in that they contain venous blood, deoxygenated blood, and they're lined with endothelium. But dural venous sinuses are not similar to veins in that they lack valves, which means blood can flow in any direction, and they lack a tunica media because it's basically dura mater, dense connective tissue lined with endothelium. That's what a dural venous sinus is. And here are the dural venous sinuses, okay? This posterior superior view, and there's our superior sagittal sinus along the top of the falx cerebri, the inferior sagittal sinus along the bottom of the falx cerebri, and there's our straight sinus right in the middle of our tentorium cerebelli, and then our transverse sinus that's going horizontally along the back or posterior surface of the falx uh, cere um, cerebelli, uh, the tentorium cerebelli. And there's our sigmoid sinus. It gets its name because it's S-shaped or sigmoid shaped. And then there's our superior and inferior petrosal sinuses that are draining down to the transverse sinus or sigmoid sinus. And then there's our cavernous sinus. And that's going to be a big one I'll talk about in a second. Now, all these dural venous sinuses ultimately drain into the internal jugular vein. Now, let's go back for a second and talk about this cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus is located on, on this each side of the cella turcica, the pituitary gland, and cranial nerves 3, 4, V1 and 2 course through the lateral wall, and cranial nerve 6 in the internal carotid artery course through the middle. Let's do that again. So here's the pituitary gland, and on either side of the pituitary gland, this is a coronal section through the cavernous sinus. On either side of the pituitary gland is the cavernous sinus in blue. And in the lateral wall are cranial nerves 3, 4, V1 and V2. And in the middle of the cavernous sinus is cranial nerve 6 and the internal carotid artery. Now, the cavernous sinus communicates with the facial vein and pterygoid plexus of veins in addition to draining into the uh, sigmoid sinus. So what we see here in this lateral view is there's our cavernous sinus. And most of the time, blood drains down through the inferior petrosal sinus into the sigmoid sinus and into the internal jugular vein. However, these superior and inferior ophthalmic veins that are draining the orbit also drain anteriorly to the facial vein. So these ophthalmic veins, blood, because these dural venous sinuses lack valves, blood can go back to the cavernous sinus or sometimes down the facial vein. This is important because if there's an infection in the orbit or the nasal region, that infection could spread through this facial vein, through the ophthalmic veins, into the cavernous sinus, and now you have an infection inside the skull. The pterygoid plexus of veins are these veins that are in the, uh, right along the, the, the pterygoid um, uh, muscles, and uh, these, these plexus, this plexus of veins in the oral cavity could also communicate down through the uh, retromandibular vein, but also go up into the cavernous sinus if you have an infection in the oral cavity. Okay, all dural venous sinuses ultimately drain into the internal jugular vein. So here's that picture, and all of those dural venous sinuses ultimately are going to drain into this internal jugular vein. So that brings us up to the circulatory system in the brain. So there's your brain. It needs blood. And so our heart is what's going to pump blood to the brain. So the heart pumps blood through the internal carotid and vertebral 
vertebral basal or arteries. And those then divide into cerebral arteries, like our anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries, the pica, and so forth. Those cerebral arteries branch and branch and ultimately become arterioles, which then drain into capillaries. Now, what makes the brain capillary so unique is that there's the blood-brain barrier. The endothelial cells make these tight junctions along with support by those astrocytes. They make it very, there's very uh, controlled environment between the internal surface of the capillary and the parenchyma of the brain. Now, capillaries drain through venules, and venules ultimately go to become cerebral veins. And cerebral veins, all of them, drain into dural venous sinuses, which then ultimately drain into the internal jugular vein, which then brings blood back to the heart, and you do this whole process again, circulate. So the two things that are very unique at this point is the blood-brain barrier, very, very controlled capillary beds, and also the dural venous sinuses, which are the separation in the two layers of the dura, and these sinuses are lined with endothelial cells, but they lack valves. Let's now go to the arachnoid mater, okay? So the arachnoid mater is the middle layer of the meninges and it drapes over the brain and the spinal cord. So there's the arachnoid mater right there, okay? Draping over the brain. And arachna means spider-like, like arachnophobia, and or afraid of spiders. And mater means mother. So that when we take a look at this, that this connective tissue that connects the arachnoid to the pia mater, kind of looks like a spider web. It's spider web like. Um, and so the space below the arachnoid mater, anatomists are like, well, what do we call it? Why don't we call it the space below the arachnoid mater? The sub arachnoid space. Sub means below. And the subarachnoid space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid, which surrounds the brain and spinal cord. So here's a coronal section. There's the arachnoid mater. There's the subarachnoid space. And it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid that is surrounding the brain and the spinal cord. It's also CSF inside the spinal cord as well. So the arachnoid, mater, the arachnoid granulations is where the CSF drains from the subarachnoid space into the superior sagittal sinus. There's the subarachnoid space, it's filled with CSF, and the CSF then flows into these arachnoid granulations, which then filter blood into the superior sagittal sinus. And that's how we get CSF back into the circulatory system. Now let's talk about pia mater. Now the pia mater is there. Okay, and pia is Latin for soft and mater is mother. It's called soft um, mother because the pia mater consists of loose connective tissue or areolar connective tissue. And it is the deepest layer of the meninges intimately associated with the brain and spinal cord. So there we can see it all close right along the brain and you see it following the contours of the gyri and sulci and even the blood vessels it makes it surrounds the blood vessels and makes a connective tissue sheath as those blood vessels dive into the parenchyma of the brain. So here's a, just a little schematic of the brain and there's pia mater. Oh, there's the pia mater hugging the contours of the brain. Where in contrast to the arachnoid mater more like drapes the contours of the brain. And between the arachnoid and pia mater, that's the subarachnoid space filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And that my friends are the meninges and dural venous sinuses in a nutshell. Mm -hmm.